that, I think, is the biggest part of Breast Fest this year. But I would encourage you to come out every year because we are always showing really interesting films, really interesting um, artwork, and we always have incredible panels, including the one tonight. And um, after films, to just take that dialogue further. I mean, one of the key components of Breast Fest is to make sure that we talk about subject matter that isn't necessarily being talked about in the regular breast cancer world, whether that's, you know, um, just because there's not enough time, or uh, it's, it's just kind of maybe a little bit of fear around it, whatever it is, we try to bring those out at Breast Fest. So sometimes our conversations get heated, and yes, we love we had, that. <laughs> we had a great panel um, discussing mammography, which has been in the headlines so much. We showed an amazing documentary from the UK, which was the documentary was really questioning some of the benefits of talking about the limitations of potential harms of mammography screening, but we had an excellent panel there to address some of those points raised in the film and really help our audience understand. We had a great documentary called Beyond the Silence, which was looking at immigrant women in Alberta and what they've gone through, some of them with their diagnosis. And as Michi said, the SCAR project itself, what I love about it is that it is showing another side to the representation of breast cancer in our society. And you know, everything, as I said, we're really known for our bold, upbeat approach, which is great. We have an event called Booby Ball, which is a super fun fundraising night, and we love that. Um, but I've been working in this field for 15 years, and I've you don't see images like this very often, even in our own education work. Um, you know, it's always the, the great pictures of survivors hugging at runs and you know pink ribbons and we're champions and that's all important and great. But what we love about these this whole project is it shows the complexities of the journey for young women and that and for all women dealing with breast cancer. Um, as David J says, breast cancer is more than a pink ribbon. It's it's a lot of stuff in between, and we think these images do a great job representing some of those complexities that young women with breast cancer deal with. So we're really happy to, that everyone here had a chance to see these pictures yeah. tonight. So without further ado, I think we'll call up Shauna Ginsberg, who is, um, what is the, I can never remember the title, the super, what? Manager of Support and Education Program. Manager of Support and <laughs> Education Programs. I just think of her as the queen of our programs. <laughs> so that's my title for her, so Shauna Ginsberg.
Cancer Trans and numerous Canadian and American Plastic Surgery Foundation funds. She is also the co-director of research for the Women for Women, a non-profit humanitarian organization for the International Plastic and Reconstructive Aesthetic Surgery Society. Dr. Zong obtained her Master's of Health and Sciences in Clinical Epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health following her clinical fellowship. She was recruited to join the Division of Plastic, Sur Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at the University of Toronto in November 2008. She is an Assistant Professor and Fellowship Director for the Breast Reconstructive Fellowship Program and the Fellowship Director for the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at the University of Toronto. In addition to her clinical interest in all forms of complex reconstruction, post-oncologic ablation, <laughs> she is the clinical and research lead of the Breast Reconstruction Program at University Health Network, a leading center for advanced techniques in breast reconstruction in North America. To complement her clinical expertise in the field of breast reconstructive surgery, her research aims to improve the access of women to optimize techniques of post mastectomy reconstruction through clinical trials and health services research. Thank you for being here. <laughs> You're obviously a very good person. given 
birth to her first uh, child, who was a seven-month-old baby girl. Um, Andrea, at that time, had already been undergoing uh, regular surveillance with mammography, MRIs, and uh, physical examination. She had been undergoing that for seven years. Um, Andrea was only 35 years old when she was first diagnosed as being a gene carrier for breast cancer. And uh, at the time when Karen, er, Stan, sorry, Andrea was seeing me, she was also seeing our gynecologist um, in talks about getting her ovaries removed. So shortly after I met Andrea, um, we decided to perform the prophylactic mastectomy with reconstruction. And in the same um, operation, she also had both her ovaries and tubes removed. So it was a very, very brave decision that she, um, um, the, a choice that she made. And uh, I'm proud to say that she just completed her reconstruction in October of last year. And um, with successful surgeries, um, and now she's here. And uh, lastly, we have Kathy. And as Shauna said, Kathy has come all the way from Thunder Bay. Kathy also has a very different story. Kathy was first diagnosed with um, in situ breast cancer, which is um, not quite breast cancer yet, in 2009, when she was 45 years old. Unfortunately, she had multiple surgeries, and after every surgery, the diagnosis became more and more severe. So three surgeries later, she was finally diagnosed with invasive breast cancer, and uh, the lumpectomies had removed the cancers completely. So after the second lumpectomy, she decided to undergo bilateral mastectomy. She lived with um, um, her bilateral mastectomy for several years before seeing me um, to reconstruct her breast, and she underwent reconstruction with me in uh, January of 2010 where we removed the tissue from her abdomen to build both breasts. And I'm also very happy to say that I saw Kathy for her uh, three-year follow-up, following reconstruction with me um, in May of last year. So that's briefly, I mean, we can't even imagine the long journey that everybody went through, but that's a brief clinical summary. So I'd like to start by asking some questions to our panelists. Um, I think my first question that I'm going to open to the floor to all of you guys was, is um, when did the topic of breast reconstruction first come up? Either in your conversation with your physicians or when did the idea first came to your minds? Maybe it was very good. Thank you, Karen. Um, I think it was mentioned that I have not had reconstruction. And um, I, it has always been part of the conversation. It, hasn't ever not been. Um, we, I talk about it with my husband, I talk about it with my oncologist, I go on the flat wearing reconstruction events and kind of think about it. Um, so it's always kind of, I guess, kind of on the table, but it's never felt like the right choice to go. Um, reconstruction for me was always on the table. choice of doing the um, prophylactic mastectomy. So the breast surgeries for me were always on the back burner um, because I lost her mom to ovarian cancer when she was very young. So breast cancer was always my, wasn't going to happen to me because I was going to die of ovarian cancer like my mother. Uh, so not until I had my ovaries and tubes out and I got the pathology back for that did then the reality of the fear of the breast cancer hit me. And so from then, it was um, sort of a no-brainer that I need to do this. And it was never really a question of reconstruction or not. If I was going to do the mastectomy, I was going to follow up with uh, reconstruction if I had the opportunity. Um, I think the same for myself when I was um, going through the different procedures and the biopsies and the testing and whatnot, it was always thought that we had come to that point and I dreaded it. I, I, um, the thoughts of having to do that, just I couldn't, I couldn't fathom it. Um, but I knew that if we really did have to do it, that reconstruction would definitely be something that I would, uh, would want to do. Um, and as it turned out, just I, I guess partly because of coming from Zender Bay, we 
don't have the same resources and surgeons and so on and so forth in Thunder Bay that maybe in larger centers um, are available. So if I could have had the, the, the bilateral mastectomy and the reconstruction done at the same time, I would have much preferred that. That's what I had hoped for and I tried to, to, to make that happen. It was just, it was impossible. I knew that I wanted Dr. Salk to do the reconstruction <laughs> and, and just that wasn't, wasn't going to be feasible to, to do that, but I knew all along that I would definitely want to do the reconstruction. So just to follow up on the theme of um, access to breast reconstruction, um, uh, as you know from <coughs> my biography, I do a lot of health services research um, regarding the whole issue with access to breast reconstruction because it's not available everywhere. And in the recent years, breast reconstruction has become a ma mainstream um, um, treatment option for women undergoing mastectomy, but that wasn't always that way. I mean, there's still a lot of misconceptions out there that women undergo breast reconstruction um, for for vain purposes, and it's, it's I think it goes so much beyond that, and we need to do what we can to banish that perception. So, with that in mind, um, I I would like to ask each panelist how just undergoing the mastectomy itself has it affected your um, your image, your femininity. Um, so I have always been very small breasted and so I've never thought of, it's never been kind of a um, defining feature of me in my breast. So um, I don't believe my husband knows me for my breast because he <laughs> made a bit of wise choice. Um, so I guess um, I've been married for 17 years now and um, you know, for four years before that. So I think for me, a lot of my family being with my mastectomy really kind of tied in with my relationship with my husband. And um, it took a while, and I'm officially very well here, I guess, but it did take a long time for me um, when, I was, when we were intimate for him to touch my bare chest. It was very, very difficult. And um, for a while, it isn't anymore. Um, and when one thing that did change for me is I went to a um, uh, a place that sells bras, and because I'm so small, it's really hard to find the stuff in bras that fit me. Um, and so they found all sorts of bras that they could sew patches in, so I could put the um, the was that a in? And um, so I walk out with my red bras and purple bras and so that really changed things for me because then I could wear everything again and feel feminine without um, needing an actual dress. Um, and I'm the opposite because I <laughs> had huge boobs. <laughs> and I was buying minimizers. I always was just getting nine dollars a bus. I don't feel that that is affected um, the 
instead to make the reconstruction. I think without the reconstruction, maybe I would have had a harder time, but because there are boobs there, and I still can put on a little bra and wear a bathing suit, and, and like I say, nobody really knows the story, so it's almost like you have this brave face. Um, and, I, and I like that about it. It makes me more comfortable. Hmm. Um, I think because of the way things went for myself, because I had the, the mastectomy, couldn't get the reconstruction at the same time. And in hindsight now, it's, it's 45 years since I was diagnosed. And when I think back to the time now, I, I would describe myself as being hysterical. I, I, I really was. I, I can remember so many people, and nobody seemed to get it. Like I just, like I'm, I have to have a mistake. Like it just was so traumatic to me. And then I went for a, a lengthy period of time without having, and I felt awful. I felt the exact opposite to what you're saying. I felt people were looking at me all the time, that I couldn't wear clothes that I would normally wear in the summer, you know, little sundresses or things like that. I was covering up everything. I've got more vests in my closet than I I remember going to Florida because at the same time too, so not only is it your appearance, the way you look, it's, I might die. Like, I, I'm still waiting for results to come in and things like that where it, this may be irrelevant, but it was still very important, but I still may be dying. Like, I might only have six months to live. So, one weekend, I went to Florida for four days. I didn't care how much it cost, but it cost, and I, I could see a sunset on the beach. And there I was, in a bathing suit with a sweater on top, because I was just so ashamed. So I think, now I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, so I went that period of time without, but now I can say, and I was so happy, oh my gosh, when I had, after I had the reconstruction, I had tubes and bags and bags, <laughs> and just, it was a horrific scene, I think, for most people to see, but I had breasts again, and it, it didn't matter to me, that for me, that was, it, it felt good again. So the mastectomy, I, I never did look at myself, I never did. The morning before I was going in for the surgery, I did take a picture of myself. That was the first time that I was unclothed. So, if I may also share part of um, your story with that time, Kathy underwent a major reconstructive surgery where we take the tissue from the abdomen and we have to put it on the chest and hook up blood vessels under the microscope. I, I believe the whole surgery took maybe 10 or even 12 hours. You were in hospital for five days. Because Kathy was from Thunder Bay, I kept you um, in Toronto for I think, the first two weeks. Finally let her go home. I was sure things were gonna be fine. And then I believe it was several weeks later, I either get an email or a phone call from a doctor in Thunder Bay saying, Kathy had come into the emergency department because she developed an infection in her abdomen. And um, I remember I, I called you and I said, you need to come in to see me, are you okay? At that point, or at any point, do you, did you feel like you were ready for a decision? No, not at all. One, the, the decision to have a reconstruction, and I, I, I went out to the mastectomy, and I don't know if that's your defense mechanism. I didn't have a choice anyways. I had to have the one removed. <coughs> the choice of having both done was, was mine, because the, the cancer was just on one side. But I'm, I've never regretted having both removed or ever regretted the reconstruction. For me, that was absolutely the right choice. Now, whether or not that's something that you make yourself believe, otherwise you can drive yourself crazy second guessing. <laughs> not a choice that you make in a vacuum alone, it's a choice that you make after you consult with family, friends, um, so can you like, share with everybody here um, what what your discussions were like with your partners, with your families, did have 
children play into whether or not he chose to have reconstruction. I remember the night before going for um, bilateral mastectomy. My daughter and I, we used to always have uh, a bath together on New Year's Eve, so I had my, my mastectomy done at the tent. And she was eight at the time that I was diagnosed, so still fairly young. And not like you, you have that book there, and I wish I had something like that to share with her at the time. Because she wasn't at, really at an age that she was old enough to really understand. She didn't have breast yet herself, but I didn't want her to be afraid. So I remember saying to her, I was going to have this surgery, and I'm getting new stuff. I'm just going to be getting new stuff. That's, that's what I do. And she could relate. She could understand that. But I did say, so for a while, I won't. There won't be anything, and I didn't want that to scare her, but to try to explain it, and, and not to scare her by saying, I have to do this because of the cancer, and then, you know, that whole side of it, but that could be part of it, too. Um, obviously, having support made the world a difference, and all my friends, my husband, my parents, my dad, my stepmother, they, all they wanted was for me to be here and to be alive. So when I sort of made the decision, there was like a cheer from the crowd. <laughs> Thank goodness, already, you know? Um, nobody pushed in any direction. Um, everyone listened a lot, came to doctor's appointments. Um, but everyone was thrilled when I, when I made it. And I think that can only go along with, you know, making it, making you feel more comfortable with your choices. And I remember seeing you in, in consultations and before and after surgery, you were always surrounded by various family members. Mm -hmm. I remember your mother-in-law was yeah. there and <laughs> passing the phone all around, making sure everybody yeah. knew that you were okay after mm -hmm. surgery. So that was very nice. Karen? Yeah, I guess the one thing that I'm conscious of is making sure my kids see me make it from time to time. Um, so that they're never surprised by the scar on my hand. And I often go talk to my daughter, my two daughters about how, you know, this is not what people look like when you develop breasts. And you know, we have we have I feel like I have to be have quite a open conversation about that kind of thing. Um, I was just telling Shauna like uh, before coming here, I was trying to tell my kids, you know, can you know, speak about this stuff to me? And, Choice of whether or not to have reconstruction, what do you think of that? And my son said, like, Can I have a snack? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how much now that is really um, concerned about it. I'm um, looking, I suspect we'll have some conversations coming up as my daughter's developments and puberty and that kind of thing. Um, and um, yeah, that's kind of the biggest part of it. Being a young woman, and also because breast reconstruction is so in the public now, mm -hmm. and the delay, and you know, sort of celebrities coming forward like that, do you feel pressure from other people to to <coughs> or to undergo reconstruction? Surprisingly, no. Um, the um, through rethink, there's quite a community of young breast cancer survivors that I've kind of tapped into, and. Um, I always get excited for my friends when they have reconstruction and nobody's at their time I said, what are you going to do? Like, it's not, I never feel that way. I'm choosing not to as well. So, um, I feel supported with whatever I choose. And I've often wondered if it came, if I had a recurrence in the other breast, would that change my decision? It may. I, so, I'm... Um, I feel really quite at peace. The, I guess with, um, with the kid thing, though, one thing I do notice is when I'm putting baby suit on, or I'm changing a public um, change room, putting a baby suit on, and there's kids around, and I'm swimming or something. I'm quite self-conscious then. And I've figured out all sorts of ways to, <laughs> to sneakily put on. But, um, yeah. If I could just say, I think one thing too, when I when I think that it, it wasn't just having had the mastectomy. Now my doctor and every, everybody who's involved in it sees it from a different point of view, right? So my oncologist, of course, you know, do the bilateral mastectomy. 
don't worry about reconstruction, who cares? Like, as far as he's concerned, that wasn't important. My family doctor, she could see both sides. She's a woman, the oncologist is a man, so they see, see things differently. Um, but she, the, what, the way she described it, when the mastectomy was done, that the surgeon did a very good job because it was very clean and it was, but it's concave. So it's not even just that you're flat. And some of the pictures, it was interesting to me, they show that. So I don't know that most people realize that. So it's not only that you could pass off as being somebody who's flat chested, but it's concave. Like, but she, because they do take so much tissue, I guess, to make sure that they get it all. You can see my heart beating. So for Andrea and Kathy, um, for both of you, you have now completed your breast reconstruction journey. Do you feel like you were you were adequately prepared for what you're living with now, your reconstructed breasts? Did it meet your expectations? It's a hard question. Especially since <laughs> Days? No. 
Um, and I don't, I, I, I like that, you know, doctors and like you say, you want to prepare pe people, with it, give them as much information as they can, but I just don't think it will ever be, it's virtually impossible to really um, make people think, oh, this is what she was talking about. This is it. <laughs> um, but as I've gone through it, I've noticed those little things, I hear voices, oh, that's what she was talking about when she said, okay, so I can hear it on even, but they're like, oh, yeah, they're evening now, she was right. Or, you know, oh, this car really is getting less rich. So the voices are all there, but it's still in the immediate first little bit, we don't hear all that. So, um, yeah, I don't think, and I think, yeah, were there more questions I should have asked? Or was there information I was missing? There weren't any gaps, no. I think my expectations were exceeded. I really do. I think, and again, maybe, if they say everything happens for a reason, so maybe it was meant that I had to go through that period of not having the breast after the mastectomy and then having the reconstruction because I was able to see what it was like not to have anything and then to have something. And for me, and everybody's different, everybody's, I wish I could have been more like that. I feel, I wish, I wish it didn't bother me as much as it did, but it did. For me, it really did. Um, and I had the prosthetic and the bra and the sticking those gel things in. And it was just a constant reminder. And I remember one day, because you don't feel anything, and I still don't, you lose all feelings. So that part of it, um, you can tell people you're going to lose feeling, but same thing, until you don't feel, you, you can't imagine. But I remember one day having a dress on it, it was something that was, you know, wasn't tight fitted or whatever. And being horrified because I didn't know if that thing had fallen out or if it was still in place or what. But it was it was a constant reminder all the time you were aware of it. And then after I had the surgery, there's days I didn't even think about it. And I'm grateful. I am so so grateful for that. That it's it's not that big a part of my life anymore. Now enough time has passed, but it's not that big a part of my life anymore. So Andrea. You were diagnosed with a PRCA gene, so that's a gene that predisposes you not only to breast cancer, but like Andrea alluded to, um, ovarian cancer and other, um, um, well, other male you know, reproductive parts. So, Andrea, we try to make things convenient for you. So, we coupled your um, first stage of breast reconstruction with the ovary and two do you have any regrets about undergoing everything all at once, or were we, were we prepared for that? Um, well, we did a breast reduction at the same time. Dr. Zahn did a breast reduction at the same time as my ovary tissues were taken out. And I remember when you first suggested it, I thought, that's crazy. Why would I have an extra surgery, still surgery? Um, but then the way you presented it to me was, uh, at the end of the day, your goal is to make us feel as normal and beautiful as possible. And Dr. Zahn explained that there would be a lot less chance, because my boobs were so big before and I had breastfed for a few months, there was some extra skin, that she could have really set herself up by doing a breast reduction first for my second surgery for the reconstruction to be much more chance of, I guess, less infection and just more symmetry and all of those things that we ultimately want. So I did think you were crazy, and I think you guys were crazy. You told me, right? But um, like I said, there's a sense of a connection. Like, and I saw several doctors, and I just trusted you and felt safe and comfortable and realized, like, you're not going to suggest this just for the fun of it. And, um, you know, when I woke up, of course, thinking, what am I crazy? I'm an infant at home, and I couldn't move my arms, and I couldn't really move here. But at the end of the day, it was, there was a closure, right? I knew that this was just one step in the process. And once the process was over, God willing, I would be done with it. So I guess knowing that there was that end in sight and feeling really informed from our conversations and the research, um, yeah, I, I believe it was the right thing. So, um, I think the final question I'm going to ask everybody is, now that you have been through it, 
what is the most important piece of advice, key piece of advice that you would, um, you know, leave women who are similar in your know, situation or maybe contemplating that they're going for restaurant construction or just thinking about the process? What's the key piece of advice you would like them to have? Um, breast cancer for me has been the single most difficult thing I've ever done. Um, and I think when I had young kids, I tried so hard to be super mom and um, be there for my kids and to build up. I wish I'd given myself a chance to heal emotionally at the time. Because I've had to play catch up a little bit with that. Um, and I don't know how much people realize how big of a part that emotional healing is. And so for me, um, I wish I had been gentle with myself. And I should put that in the back. <laughs> I guess just to trust, um, trust your instincts and do what's best for you. What's, just because people say this is what you should look like and this is what you should do, it's such a personal choice. Um, I spoke to a, a lot of people, I asked a lot of questions, um, and it's scary and to, I, had, I think just having support and knowing you're not weak, it, it's, like you said, and, you know, it was the worst thing I've ever had to go through, and um, any surgery, regardless of what it's for, is overwhelming, and I would just say access whoever you can, um, and just be true to yourself and do what you feel best for you, with no judgment. Easier said than done, but I'm getting there. <laughs> I think the same thing too. I think everybody, it's a very personal choice what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And I think the one piece of advice would be to find as much information as you can. And for myself, I um, did a lot of reading and research, and one uh, site that I used quite often was this breastcancer.org. So you were able to. You almost felt like you were, I don't know what the word is, like a peeping Tom almost, but because you were reading such personal stories about different people, but you could see lots of different perspectives and get lots of in, you know, different information that way. And I think for me, knowledge was, was definitely very helpful. Well, that's, that theme is in keeping with the um, Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day, which is there, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no right timing. It is only one that you are going to live with. The only one that you're just, you, it has to feel right to you. Um, and knowledge, knowledge is power. And um, so I'd like to thank all three of my panelists for sharing extremely intimate details and um, reliving, you know, probably memories that you didn't want to relive but just for the sake of sharing it with everybody. So I thank you for being so honest.
but we do our darn best to try to keep the same thing as close as possible. Can you see what those options are? Like, there's one where you take the muscle from the stomach and then I think another is an implant, and then there's also um, uh, something that Suzanne Summers was talking about, because they sort of take the fat and they whip it. And <laughs> <laughs> mainstream ways of reconstructing a breast are still using either an implant or a prosthesis um, or using your own tissue. And then I suppose a third option is a combination of the two. So using your own tissue, the most common place that we take that tissue from is from your lower tummy. So generally that's where we carry most of our weight in. There's more redundant stuff down there. So um, we can transfer it up to the breast with or without the muscle. So we used to have to pull it up through the muscle. The muscle kind of acts as a vehicle for pulling it up. We now have a more sophisticated ways of doing that because we know that if we can, we don't want to violate your abdominal muscle because that's what it does with you sit-ups and um, functional things like that. So now we can just take the skin and the fat from your abdomen, remove it all together, put it on your chest, hook up the blood vessels so that it survives through new blood vessels um, without and violating your, your, your abdominal muscle. That's one major way. The other way is using something like an implant. So something similar to a women um, who have augmentation have. Other than the differences, this time the prosthesis or the implant has to be underneath your chest muscle. And normally there isn't a space for that underneath your chest muscle, so we have to artificially create that space. And sometimes it takes time to create that. So what Suzanne Summers is referring to with whipping up this fat is um, that's more of a procedure that we use for fine tuning. So if there's a little bit of area of flatness or irregularity, we can liposuction fat from you know, places that you have extra fat and inject it in so that things contouring is smoother. But we don't generally use that as to create a whole breast. Mm -hmm. And can you use implant whether or not radiation? Generally speaking, implants and radiation don't go hand in hand together very well. Um, because radiation does damage the tissues, and makes things less elastic, um, and there are higher complications with using implants when there's when your tissues have been radiated. So usually we have to use your own tissue along with implants. We have a question over here. Um, I was just curious, looking at the scar project and the diff. There's so many different types of scars, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's not like one type of surgery. And I'm curious if we are looking. I mean, most of the women are from the states, so we're dealing with healthcare issues. And sometimes I wonder, are we looking at just different types of doctors? Are we looking at class? What are we looking at here, or is it just different types of surgery? I so I think and different bodies. Different bodies, yeah. I so so I think. Images that I see here is actually a really nice cross-sectional um, uh, representation of the women that I see in my clinic. So everybody has a different body habitus, and because of different treatments that you may have had or not had, certain options may be available to you and not available to someone else. So when I look around this room, I see you know different types of reconstruction where it may be necessitated because they don't have enough tissue in areas or because they may have had radiation or chemotherapy. Um, but I think what I see is a really accurate representation. Thank you. How long does it take to do the complete like from the time you start to finish? Unfortunately, probably too long. Um, <coughs> there used to be this belief that when you are diagnosed with breast cancer, you have to live with your mastectomy defect for two or even three years to make sure that cancer doesn't come back before we reconstruct. We now know that not to be true. However, depending on the uh, reconstruction method that you have, so for example, if you have an implant, oftentimes we have to put a spacer or a temporary prosthesis there to artificially create that space. That's one surgery. You have to keep coming back to me for that prosthesis to be pumped up. That may take two or three months. You have to wait three months after that for all your tissues to heal. Then you have to have another surgery. 
where we take out this temporary prosthesis, putting the per permanent prosthesis. Then you wait three months for that balancing on the other side, and then having the bulgariola <coughs> takes a year to um, undergo. Um, other times when we're using the tissue from your abdomen, even though we do everything all at once, it's a long procedure. It takes a, maybe 12 hours when we're doing both sides. You're in hospital for five days. We say recovery is two to three months. And then you have to come back for another surgery where we do the, the nipple and the finishing touches. It's still too long, right? Maybe I could follow up on that question by asking two of you who had that procedure. <coughs> Speaking from the perspective of um, someone whose partner just had your procedure, um, and what that six, eight, ten, twelve um, period is like psychologically, you know, as, you, as you see the change, as you see the healing. The next stage, what that's like. I think one thing Dr. Zong said to me when she was preparing me for the surgery was that it could take 10 to 12 hours, which seemed mind blowing to me. <coughs> and based on everything I've read and different people's experiences, that was true. Um, but she said, You are going to feel like you were hit by a truck. You wake up. And that was a very, very good description because I remember vividly when I woke up, it was. You did. You just felt like you were hit by a truck. But every single day, it felt better. Like every day, there was improvement. Mind you, in my case, because I ended up with the incision, got the infection where the, the tissue was taken from, and because I was having to come from Thunder Bay, I don't know if it might have been different had I been here, but because I was having to come back and forth, so um, it did seem like a long time at the time. But now in hindsight that seems like such a small piece of the puzzle. Like that's behind me now. I, I'm thrilled. I am absolutely thrilled and wouldn't hesitate to make that same decision again. So the answer to your question would get it continues to get better every day. Yeah. Mine was different though because my I didn't have it to standards and I put my faith and was a I didn't know which was I going to get chosen for the, the allergen, which was the one step. And um, that's what I thought I wanted. And then I realized, you know, there's pros and cons to both. So I actually had my mastectomy by my surgeon. And then Dr. Zong came in and put the one step. They were already made and ordered for my size. I had a you design them. And they popped them in. And I didn't have any other surgeries. So that psychologically just knowing, before I knew which implants I was going to get, I was horrified. Um, thinking, well, what if I get the other one and then I have to have another surgery? Because it, it's, it is psychological. You wake up, you know, okay, at least the surgeries are done. So every day it's not even better. I'm not going to have to go back under and do it again. But um, it does. It, it screws with your head a lot. But it does get better. Yes? I'm going to touch you. How else do you do create the nipple? So the nipple itself, um, Usually, there's enough tissue around the breast itself that we um, make small incisions and we gather it. I, I tell my patients, it's kind of like organic. We, we fold it and we make a 2D surface into kind of another. And around the outside, where the areola is, generally we tattoo it. But some patients don't like the idea of having even a medical tattoo, in which case we can take skin grafts from elsewhere on your body. We should take those skin grafts from places that are concealed so nobody would know that there is a hidden incision somewhere. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Comments? I have a question. If, um, if a woman has uh, a mastectomy or bilateral mastectomy and then chooses to have a child, how does it affect that prosthetic implant for the reconstruction? Um, so, if someone has had a mistake in reconstruction yes. of any type, um, <coughs> if it's an implant procedure, 
we obviously they can't breastfeed from it because there's no breast tissue I left. Understand. But in terms of healing and other things, it, everything would go on as you normally would. Okay. Um, if you had the tissue taken from your abdomen, and because you know when you're pregnant, you have to allow things to stretch. Generally, people do okay. But I do follow my patients very closely, especially young women who have a pregnancy after I take tissue from their abdomen, just to make sure that they don't have complications from the surgical scar. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists and me for sharing your stories. And with all of us, and Dr. Song, thank you so much. You're obviously compassionate and passionate about what you do. And <laughs> um, so please feel free to uh, hang out for a bit, you can look at the images. Unfortunately we're out of the programs um, which actually tell a story about every single photograph. Uh, we are having more printed and the gallery will be open this week if you'd like to come back um, and take a look. Uh, if you want, I can also send you a digital copy of all the bios for all the photographs. Um, I can give you my card and you can contact me by email as well. So and that not just the entrance to the website where these pictures are? No? Um, no, the SCAR Project website is separate oh, from, right. from us. It has its own website. Oh, okay. um, the bios are done in a program book that follows the SCAR Project around. And just to let everyone know, the SCAR Project is actually 100 photos. And so David J, the photographer, kind of keeps a rotation of about 30 photos. So each time you see the exhibit, it's always changing and growing and evolving. Yeah. And just one other thing, as a breast visitor, is that we do have another talk on Thursday night. Thank you. We have a, a, a different style of talk, more in the cultural critique kind of way, in and around beauty and body image and um, the beauty myth and how different images affect women's identities and sense of self and, and where the SCAR project fits into that conversation. So it's a similar time, 5.30 to 7, so anyone who'd like to come back, that'd be great as well. Thank or you. spread word. Or spread word, yes, thank you. <laughs>